So in this video, I just wanted to kind of go over high-level overview of the various concepts within Webpack and also get us uh, an introduction into their documentation. So if you come to the webpack.js.org website, uh, this is obviously the website for Webpack. If you click on documentation, the first thing it's going to bring you to is this section on concepts. Uh, right here on the left-hand side, you can see the breakout of all the things we're going to be talking about. So at a high level, there's really only a handful of things you really need to understand to grasp how Webpack works. There's a concept of an entry, an output, loaders, plugins, and mode. Um, so entry is basically the file that is the entry point for Webpack. So typically, it's um, in a source folder. It's called index.js. And this is the entry point where all your other JavaScript files, all your CSS, SCS files, etc., all need to come into this single file, and then Webpack will process everything directly from that single file. The next is the output. So once you have an entry going in, once Webpack has um, processed everything and it's ran through all the loaders and everything and processed all of your various files, it then needs to know, okay, where do I output all of these bundles that I need to create? And so right here, we've got our path and our file name. And just to be clear, I'm going over these very quickly. I'm going to go over all of this in much greater detail throughout the course and throughout the videos. This is just a high-level overview before we get into that. So we've got our entry. We've got an output. So essentially, Webpack, here's the file you need to look for to process everything. And then here's the output of where to process or where you're going to output all the files you processed. Or here's where to put that all those bundled files. Then we have the concept of a loader, and a loader essentially is a way of telling Webpack how to process a specific file type. So out of the box, Webpack doesn't know what to do with a .css file. You need a CSS loader for that. Or in this example, um, a .txt file. So if you have a .txt file, Webpack has no idea how to handle that. You need to then use this raw loader which will then process the text file. And this is the same for JSON files, for .png, um, .jpg, for font files, anything you can imagine. Uh, you're going to need a specific loader in order to transform and handle those specific file types. Then there's also this concept of plugins. So plugins essentially just add additional functionality to Webpack. Um, in this example, this HTML Webpack plugin, we actually use this throughout the course. Um, what this is going to do is when you uh, include it, is it's going to automatically create a index.html file once you build everything. So that way, when you've got your CSS files, your JavaScript files and everything, when you do the production build and it outputs all your assets into like a dist folder, it will automatically create the index.html, which will then have references to all of your CSS files and your JavaScript files. So it'll include, you know, the script tags that say source equals, and then the, you know, the relative path to the JavaScript file. And the same goes for CSS or any other files. And then the final thing I want to discuss is this concept of mode. So, um, Webpack, this is new as of, I believe version four. So this is something fairly new since the latest version or the last version. And what this does is this tells uh, Webpack the different modes and configurations that it needs to be in. So throughout the course, we're going to create a total of three Webpack configurations, but two of them are in specific modes. So we're going to create a config for exclusively for development, and then we're going to create one exclusively for production. And this is just a way to kind of flag a specific file and to tell Webpack how to handle different situations and configurations and how to build and uh, bundle files depending upon what environment you need to be in. Um, the last thing about browser compatibility, uh, I'm not too worried about that um, because we're going to be handling our JavaScript and everything with Babel. So this really isn't an issue because Babel is going to take care of all that JavaScript stuff for us. So we don't really need polyfills or anything like that. Um, so that pretty much sums it up. I just wanted to do a quick kind of overview of the concepts that we're going to be going over. Uh, throughout this course and obviously in future videos we're going to be going over each and every single one of these various concepts in greater detail.
So in this video, we're going to be setting up and installing Webpack from scratch. Uh, the first thing I want to do before we get started is I just want to make you aware of this repo that I've created specifically for this course. So if you go to my GitHub profile, github.com slash my name, Robert Gus, and then Webpack 5 Fundamentals course, this contains all the code that we're going to be writing throughout this course. And if you click on this master branch drop down here, I've created branches for all the videos at every step of the way. So if you get stuck at a particular point or your code isn't working, you can just check out one of these branches at the specific point and then you'll have the same code that I'm using in the videos. Uh, this is really useful for debugging. If you have some kind of issue that you don't know what's going on, just check your code with what I've got in this repo and make sure it matches um, identically. And in worst case scenario, you can just copy and paste to get everything working. Uh, but if you still have issues, uh, definitely hit me up in the forums and in the questions, and I'll be sure to answer them as soon as I possibly can. Uh, so the first thing you want to do is you need to make sure that you've got Node.js installed. So if you go to nodejs.org, uh, you're going to want to click on this LTS version. This is the long-term support version. At the time, I've got 12.18.3. Uh, it doesn't really matter as long as you're pretty much, if you've got a version greater than 10, you should be fine. Uh, so make sure you download this. This is available for all platforms, Linux, Windows, Mac. It's very straightforward. It installs just like any other program or application. So once you've got Node.js installed, you can confirm it by going to your terminal and typing in node space dash v. And so I've got version 12.18.0. Um, and I'm currently just in an empty directory in my system. I've called it Webpack 5 Fundamentals. As you can see, there's nothing in here. Uh, you can call it whatever you like. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to initialize a, a new Git repository. Uh, you don't have to do this for the video. I'm just doing this for my own sake to keep track of things. Um, after that, we need a package.json file in order to install Webpack because we need uh, NPM. So if you run npm init-y, this will create a brand new package.json file for us, which is exactly what we need. So guys, throughout this course, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be walking you through uh, the documentation as much as I possibly can. And the reason for that is I kinda wanna teach you how to teach yourself. Um, what happens with a lot of these courses is you take a tutorial and it's not specific enough to your needs. And so you take the tutorial and you understand what the other person's doing and you're copying and pasting and typing in their code. But then when it comes time to actually applying it for your own specific project and you have unique needs, it's tough to really know where to go and how to get those answers. So my hope is by teaching you, by walking through the documentation, you'll be able to find out everything you possibly need about Webpack when you need to do things that are very specific to your project that I'm not covering in this course in particular. Again, if you have issues, just hit, uh, hit me up in the forums and I'll uh, help you out as much as I possibly can. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do, you want to go to webpack.js.org. This is Webpack's homepage. Go to documentation. Then we're going to go down here to guides. And we're going to follow along with this getting started guide. So the first thing we do, we're going to make a folder, which we already did, npm init-y. That creates that package.json file that we just did. So now we need to install Webpack and Webpack CLI. Uh, there's only one slight little modification we need, and that's to install Webpack add next. And that's going to give us the latest version of Webpack, which is Webpack 5. So if we do npm install Webpack add next, then we're going to do Webpack CLI dash dash save dash dev. This will get us what we need in order to get Webpack installed. Okay, cool. So Webpack's installed and Webpack CLI is installed. Now let's go back to our text editor. I'm going to create a new directory called source, src, and then I'm going to stick a new file in there. I'm just going to call it index.js. And for something real simple, I'm just going to do a console log of hello from Webpack. Okay, cool. Let's go back to the docs and see what we need to do next. Uh, this is for a basic setup, and I want to show you the little more advanced setup, because this is what you're going to see in the real world. 
and these are the things we're going to be covering in this course, is how to use a Webpack configuration. So we first need to create this webpack.config.js. So if we go back to our text editor, um, within the root of the project, create this webpack.config.js file. Let's go back. And then within webpack.config, uh, we're going to put in this code. I'm going to copy and paste this right now, and then I'm going to walk you through what each, each line is doing. So the first thing we're doing is we're including this path module. Uh, this comes from Node itself. This is not anything related to Webpack in particular. Then we're doing module.exports. Again, this is specific to Node. We're exporting this object. And so now we're getting into Webpack stuff. The first thing you see here, this uh, entry called, or I'm sorry, this key called entry. This is extremely important. This is telling Webpack, okay, Webpack, all of the files, everything that you need to bundle is going to be coming from this file, which we just created, this src index.js, which just says it's console.log. But in the future, we're going to have CSS files and additional JavaScript files. Everything is going to flow through this single index.js file. Now, you can also have multiple entries when you want to do code splitting, but that's something we'll get to later on in the course. The next one that's extremely important is this output file. So this output key is this object here, and we're telling, this tells Webpack, take everything from this index.js file. When you're done bundling everything and processing it, output it with the file name main.js, and then output it to this path. And so this is where this path module is coming into play, where we're basically saying, stick everything into the root of this directory into a folder called dist. Now, as you can see, dist does not exist, but when we run the command, Webpack will make that folder for us. I also like to call uh, my bundles bundle.js. That just makes it really clear that this index.js is the source file, and this bundle.js is something that Webpack, um, Webpack outputted and created for us. So let's go back to our docs. So they have us running a command in the terminal here, but I'm just going to skip that because the much easier way is just to do an npm script. So we're just going to create this build webpack command. So if we go back to our text editor, back to the package.json, replace this test command with build, and then we're just going to do webpack. So if we go back to our terminal, clear this, do npm run build, So you can see everything worked, everything's green, built bundle.js. And then if we come back to our code editor, now we've got that disk folder and here's our bundle, which is not too exciting. It's literally the same code that we had in the index source file. But the good news is if you've gotten this far, everything's working, Webpack is wired up and working properly. Uh, but if you could tell, the only issue with this is every time we make a change to our source file, we're gonna have to be manually writing and typing in that command and running that build command constantly every time we're making changes, uh, which is not ideal, especially in development. So in the next video, what we're going to be doing is setting up the Webpack dev server with hot module reloading. So in this video, we're going to be setting up a uh, Webpack dev server with hot module reloading. Uh, so we're back in the guides again uh, under documentation, guides, and we're under this development tab over here. And if you click right here, it says using Webpack dev server. This is the section that we're at. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to install Webpack Dev Server with npm. So let's run that. Uh, there's another thing we're going to need while we're here. Might as well just install it now. And that's this plugin that they've got here in this config file called HTML Webpack Plugin. So what this does essentially is this is a plugin that's going to automatically generate our index.html file. So that way when we run our builds in our dev server, Webpack has something to host in the dev server. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about what this is doing once we actually install it. So go back to your terminal, and now we're going to install, let me just clean this up a bit, uh, npm install dash dash save dash dev 
HTML dash webpack plugin. Let's get that installed too. And then once this is installed, I'll show you how to configure everything. So if you take a look at the docs, you'll see they've got some additional stuff in here. So here's our webpack plugin. So we need to include it from our NPM modules. They've also got some other things in here. There's this mode key called development. And this is something new that was introduced in Webpack 4. Uh, we're going to be covering this in greater detail later on in the course. Uh, but essentially, this tells Webpack for the different environments that you're in. Uh, in this case, we're in development. There's also one for production. There's also this new thing right here, this dev server. This is what tells Webpack where to, where this tells Webpack dev server. Uh, where to serve up the files and they're all going to be coming from that disk directory and then we also need to include the html webpack plugin down here so let's go back to our config file and let's uh, start setting all this stuff up so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a mode key and we're going to call this development and then underneath our entry file the order of this isn't super important but you can just follow along and see what i'm doing we're going to add this dev server object our key which is an object and then we're going to do content base dist so again like I said earlier this is telling webpack dev server where to serve up our files from so in development it's going to serve everything up uh, from memory so it's not going to output to this dist folder here that's only when you're doing a, like a production build uh, the next thing we need to do is create this plugins key and the plugins is going to be an array and it's going to be new HTML webpack plugin like this you can also pass in an object and give it something like a title so we'll just give it development uh, now if you notice I have um, my VS code will automatically pull stuff in when I save it um, so if your text editor doesn't do it, just make sure you've got HTML Webpack plugin and you're requiring the HTML Webpack plugin here. Now the next thing we need to do is set up our dev script. So if we come down here, we're going to create a dev command. And this command is going to be webpack dev server dash dash open. And so we run dev, it's going to run the server, and this flag, this dash dash open, will automatically open up a browser window for us. Uh, so let's go back and run npm run dev. Cool, so it opens up a new window, and if we look into the console, we see our hello from webpack that's coming from our index.js and you can see that we've got live reloading enabled so this is hot module this WDS is webpack dev server and hot module reloading is enabled so if I come back to the text editor let me do hello from webpack dev server and we save that it's going to automatically update for us. So it doesn't refresh the page, it just injects it for us automatically. So we're all set up with the Webpack dev server and hot module reloading. In the next video, we're going to be installing and configuring Babel. So in this video, we're going to be setting up and configuring Babel. Uh, if you're not familiar with Babel is, it's a tool that allows us to, uh, in their own words, use next generation JavaScript today. So we can write future JavaScript that the browsers don't technically understand quite yet, and Babel will transpile it down into a version of JavaScript that the browsers do understand. So if you come to their website, babeljs.io, click on the Setup tab, and under Build Systems, click on a Webpack. And they make it super easy to get things set up and installed. So if you click on this Copy button, this will copy this command here. So if you come to our terminal, let's install Babel Loader and Babel Core. And then we're going to come back here. And then there's this copy function to when it says here the via config, this is our webpack config. So if you come back here into our text editor, 
And what we need to do now, so this is getting into the concept of loaders, which we uh, briefly went over in one of the earlier videos. So essentially what a loader is, uh, again, is a loader is telling jo um, Babel, when you come across a specific file, use this loader in order to process it. So in this case, we need to set up this Babel loader, which we just installed, and we need to tell Webpack, every time you come across a JavaScript file, run it through the Babel loader, so that way Babel's going to parse all of our JavaScript. So underneath the dev server, we can create this module key, and within it we create this rules. Actually, let's see what I, maybe they might have already given it to us. Yeah, they did. So we don't actually need to create this module from scratch. It's already in the, uh, remember I just copied it from the, right here. So if we come back, um, essentially what this is saying are, it's creating some rules and it's telling JavaScript, or I'm sorry, Webpack, that every time you come across this a .js file, so this is just a regular expression, and this test key is saying, Webpack, every time you come across a .js extension, or a file with a .js extension, run it through this loader, Babel loader. And you know what, in fact, let me uh, put this on separate lines so it's a little easier for us to read. Cool. So anything with the .js extension, run through the Babel loader, and this exclude is saying, don't process any JavaScript files located within the node underscore modules folder. And then just one more quick thing. We've got to install this. This is the Babel preset env. Come back here, paste that into our terminal. Don't think the copy worked. Let's try it again. Okay. <laughs> copy and paste is working. Let's try it manually. Copy. Come back. All right, cool. So essentially what this is doing is this is a file that tells, uh, just gives a set of instructions on Babel on how to process the JavaScript files. And so you can install different configurations and different presets if you want certain versions of JavaScript processed a different way, or if you're targeting really old browsers or you're only targeting new browsers. Uh, but for the most part, this is the best way, and it covers th like the vast majority of use cases. So the final thing we need to do is create this .babelrc file and then paste in this little snippet down here. Come back to our code editor. Um, I've already got one here, so we need to create this .babelrc file, and then we're just going to paste in presets, babel preset env. Um, so now... If we come back to our index.js file, uh, I am just going to write in a simple um, arrow function, and we'll see how Babel processes it. So I'm just going to do const foo equals name, and I'm just going to console.log simple. We we'll use string interpolation. We'll do uh, name. So let's invoke it and pass it my name. Cool. So this is a very basic uh, arrow function. It just takes in a name and is console locking with string interpolation, hello name. Then I invoke it foo, and then I pass in my name here. Let's come back to our terminal and run npm run build. Okay. Let's go back to text editor, and then in our disk folder, bundle.js. So you can see in our index file, we've got this arrow function, we've got string interpolation. This is like, quote unquote, more modern JavaScript. But if you look at what's being output in our bundle, you'll see that it's doing hello, and then it's doing this dot concat name. Um, so it's this is what Babel does. Babel is going to uh, this isn't necessarily the greatest example, but it's just a quick example. So as you're writing like future JavaScript with the latest syntax, Babel is going to automatically transpile it down into an 
a quote unquote older version of uh, JavaScript or a version that the browsers better understand. So that way you can write the latest and greatest JavaScript today and make sure that it works in, you know, Chrome, Firefox, and you can even do it down to like Internet Explorer 11 or probably even easier earlier versions if you needed to. Um, so that pretty much wraps up this video. Um, in the next video, we're going to be going over how to work with CSS, SCSS, and how to set up and install the loaders for it. So in this video, we're going to be setting up and telling Webpack how to deal with um, CSS files. And in particular, we're going to be using SAS or the uh, SCSS version. That's the one that I particularly like to use. If you like the indented flavor, the .SASS, this will work just the same. Um, so the first thing, we need to install a few different loaders. So again, if you remember, we had to install Babel Loader to handle our JavaScript files. And so in order for Webpack to recognize and understand how to handle our SCSS files or our SAS files, we've got to set up and install a few different loaders. So there's three in total that we need to set up. So the first thing we need to do is install the CSS loader and the style loader. And these two loaders al allow Webpack to recognize and understand .css files. So let's go back to our terminal here. And we're going to do npm install dash dash save dash dev style loader and CSS loader. Cool. And then while we're in here, we might as well just install SAS because we're going to need that eventually dash dash save dash dev and we're going to install sass loader and sass great now we've got those installed let's update our webpack config and add in a new rule so webpack knows what to do with css files or scss in this particular case so after this object here is for our JS files, we're going to create a new one. And we're going to do test forward slash backslash dot scss dollar sign forward slash i. Oops, sorry. Uh, again, that's a regular expression. So this is just telling Webpack, anytime you come across a file with a dot scss extension, run it through these loaders. And so, since we installed a few of them, we got to tell Webpack to use them. Uh, the order of this is important, so you got to make sure that these loaders are running in the correct order. So we do CSS lo loader first, then it's going to run through, I'm sorry, style loader first, then CSS loader, and then it's going to go through SAS loader. Great. And so now what we need to do is we need to first create our SAS file. So let's go into the source directory here. Let's create a new file. And we're just going to call this main.scss. And within this main.scss, I'm just going to do a variable. And I'm going to call it body color. It's going to make it red. And then we're going to do body background is our variable body color cool. So we've got our SAS file, but now we need to get it inside of our, we need to import it inside of our index.js because remember, everything needs to come through our index.js because that's the entry point into Webpack. So let's put this over here and we'll just do uh, import dot forward slash main dot scss and now let's run our dev server. npm run dev. Cool. So our development server is running, opens up the tab, and if you notice, pretty obvious, the entire background's red. So SAS is set up and configured, our loaders are set up and configured properly, and so we've got that all running, which is great. Uh, the next video, we're going to set up post-CSS, and then we're going to introduce this new plugin called Mini CSS Extract Plugin, which will allow us to, um, when we run that build command in our production build, so when we run Webpack build, it'll actually output the CSS into a separate 
uh, file instead of keeping everything inside of JavaScript. Okay, so now that we've got SAS and CSS set up, let's install PostCSS along with some uh, helpful and really cool plugins I think you'll enjoy. So first things first is since we're introducing uh, something new to Webpack, uh, we need to install a new loader. So let's install the PostCSS loader. We can use this command right here. Let's go to our terminal, npm install dash d postcss loader. Uh, if you've never seen the hyphen capital D, that's the same as doing the dash dash save dash dev. It's just a little shortcut. Cool. Uh, another thing we're going to install is actually before we get to that, let's set up our postcss config. Um, so we need to create a file called postcssconfig.js. So I'll just do it from here. Postcss. I'll just touch the file here, and then while I'm in here, I'm going to install um, some additional uh, postcss plugins. So CSS Nano, Auto Prefixer, and Rucksack CSS. Um, just type in this command as you see it, and then I'll go over and explain what each of these plugins actually does. Uh, Suppose so CSS is going to automatically add vendor prefixes, um, which I'll demonstrate in a moment. Um, so it'll add things like Moz for Mozilla Firefox, MS prefixes, WebKit, things like that. There's even this little auto prefixer.github.io. This is like a little playground where you can type in your quote unquote normal CSS and then it'll show you um, what CSS um, auto prefixer will output. So, see, you can see here it does WebKit user select, Moz user, MS user. It adds in all those vendor prefixes for us automatically so we never have to worry about it again. Uh, CSS Nano is a minifier and it compresses our CSS so it's much faster to read and parse speeds up load times and then rucksack this is one of my personal favorites if you go to rucksackcss.org and you come to the docs section this just has a bunch of helpful like little utilities that you can use and one of my personal favorites is this uh, responsive typography so if you give a class with a font size of responsive it's going to automatically adjust the font size width uh, depending upon screen size, and the way it does that is once it's done, uh, PostCSS is running the plugin, it outputs this kind of complicated CSL's calc function, which I'll demonstrate once we get everything set up and running. Uh, the final thing we're going to do is we're going to install this mini CSS extract plugin, and what you can see down here on the left hand side in the docs under mini CSS extract plugin, what this does is this is going to extract all of our CSS out of our bundle.js into its own CSS file. Uh, so let's run this command and get this set up. Cool. So now that we've got everything installed, we can get everything uh, up and running again. So we need to uh, update our Webpack config. So first thing we need to do is we need to um, include that mini CSS plugin that we just installed mini CSS extract plugin. Cool. And then we're going to update our loaders a little bit. So if you come down here to our SCSS section in the use array, add in an object, and we're going to add loader mini CSS extract text plugin dot loader and then options this is for hot module reloading I'll explain what this does after I'm done typing it no DNV oops okay so this is telling Webpack, anytime you come across this .scss file, you're going to run it through this mini CSS extract plugin loader. And then if we are in development mode, which is based upon our node environment variable, uh, enable hot module reloading. Another thing we need to do is we no longer need style loader because that has to do with injecting 
the CSS into the DOM and this kind of takes care of that. So we can get rid of this and then we can add in our post CSS loader. So the ordering of this is super important. So make sure it's CSS loader, post CSS loader, then your SAS loader. And then finally at the very bottom down here, we need to include our uh, mini CSS plugin. Yep. Pass in an object, a file name. I'll explain this after I'm done typing it real quick. Okay, so see how this says file name bundle.js? So our JavaScript bundle, that webpack, webpack outputs is just going to be bundle.js. We're passing it a file name, so the mini CSS extract plugin is what what file name do you want the CSS file to be once it's done writing it to its own file. Uh, we could just hard code this and give it like main.css. Um, or in Webpack, you can also put in these little brackets with name. And this is like a little placeholder. So whatever our uh, CSS file is called, in this case it's main.css, or scss, I'm sorry. It'll be output as main.css. <clears throat> so we could do the same thing down here. We could do name.js, and then it would output as index.js. Uh, so now that we've got that set up, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we need to uh, modify and update our post CSS config. And so this is a configuration file specifically for post CSS. And this is how we tell it to uh, which plugins we want post CSS to use. Because out of the box, post CSS doesn't do anything. You have to tell it which plugins you want it to run on your code. So we're going to use auto prefixer. And I'm just going to duplicate these a couple times. Uh, CSS nano and this one is actually a string which is rucksack so if you'll notice um, I'm passing in these or I'm giving it empty objects this is if you look up each plugin you can pass in additional configuration and options specifically for the auto prefixer plugin the CSS nano or the rucksack plugin uh, but I don't really need any of those. The defaults are just fine, so I'm going to leave that as is. One thing that Auto Prefixer, however, does need is something called a browsers list. So if you do browsers list RC, so you need this dot file, dot browsers, plural, list RC. And essentially what this does is this tells Auto Prefixer um, which browsers to target. So this is a pretty useful one that I found is pretty common and it handles the majority of use cases in my opinion um, <clears throat> what this saying is target any browsers that are within the last two years greater than 1% in use and they're not dead um, I will configure this and change this to a different setting to kind of show you some different options that you get once I start building and outputting stuff uh, the last thing I'm going to do I'm actually going to come back here and I'm going to copy all of this code so that you can see the output once we actually run it. So I'm going to get rid of this. We don't need the variables. We know that that's working. So here's just some CSS. And then I also want to include that rucksack property. So if I do font size responsive. That should give us the kind of crazy CSS calc function I was talking about. Uh, so that should be everything. Let's give this a rip, see what happens. Uh, this is just an alias, by the way, in my shell. NR dev stands for uh, NPM run dev. And that's actually not what I want to do. Sorry. I want to run NR build. So the NR again is just an alias for NPM run. It's just a shortcut. Yep. And we get an error. To the error no modules. Module build failed. Post CSS plugin failed. Cannot find module CSS nano. Uh, I probably made a typo. Yep. Too many ends. Let's try that again. Great. 
So let's take a look and see what it did. If we go in our disk file, now we've got a main.css and here's our CSS. Now this isn't super easy to read because again, we've got uh, CSS Nano running, which is going to compress everything. So just for the sake of demonstration, I am going to delete this and then run this again so that it doesn't compress the CSS. Cool, open this back up, and here's our CSS. So as you can see, auto prefixer is working. It's adding in our WebKit, Moz, MS user, um, vendor prefixes. And also you can see here, our font size is responsive here, but then Rucksack runs, and then it converts it into this kind of weird uh, calc function which is how it's handling all the responsiveness and then it even adds these media queries for setting up the body font size. So one last quick thing before uh, we're all set. I'd wanted to show you how this browser list will update and change what gets output by the auto prefixer. So here's my settings right now. If I go back to this playground here you can see the browser list just says last version, last four version. And if I go back to here and I paste that in, now when I run this, you'll see that the CSS output is entirely different. The reason why is because before we, we were targeting just the last two years and only certain browsers, this one is much more broad and it's targeting the last four versions of all the major browsers. So now if you look, we've got transition, the display grid, we've got additional vendor prefixes, and then also for the background where we're using gradients, we've got O linear gradient, WebKit gradient. So I just want to quickly show you that, that depending upon what you put in the browser list here, it's going to determine what um, vendor prefixes get output here. So that pretty much wraps it up for this video, guys. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to be showing you how to set up specific configs or webpack configs that is for development and production environments. Okay, so in this video where you're going to be um, splitting up this our webpack.config.js into two separate configs. We're going to be uh, splitting it into a development config and a production config. And so the reason for doing this is this way you can set up webpack to utilize different um, options, um, environment variables. You can have it set up to use different plugins and loaders and whatever other um, things you need Webpack to do for those specific environments. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this our uh, config and I'm just going to call this webpack.prod.js and then I'm going to rename our Webpack config to webpack.dev.js and so what we need to do now is update our scripts in our package.json to take advantage of these uh, new config files so for build we're going to do uh, webpack we're going to pass in a config flag and we're going to tell it to use the webpack.prod.js and then for the webpack dev server we're going to pass in the config flag and tell it to use webpack.dev.js. Uh, another thing too I like to do is for the build, I like to specifically set the node environment equal to production. And you'll see why in just a second. I use that for post CSS. Uh, it's not necessary to do this for Webpack, but I'm going to do this specifically for um, our post CSS config, which you'll see a little in a little bit. So if we go back here to our webpack.dev.js. Um, we can now go through this file and think, okay, what what does this config need to be exclusively for development? So the first thing is we no longer need this CSS extract plugin because we're only extracting the CSS when we do a production build. So we can delete uh, this entirely and we can delete this plugin. Cool. Uh, another thing we want to do is because now that we have um, 
a config specifically for development is we want to set up source maps. And so source maps, if you're not familiar, will allow you to um, it helps with debugging. So if you have multiple JavaScript files and there's an error in one of those files, when you look into the console, it'll spit out and tell you exactly what file it's coming from. Um, and we're going to set that up for both our JavaScript and for our SCSS. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is under entry, we're going to enter in a new key called DevTool. And it's called inline source map. This will enable source maps for our JavaScript. And then in order to enable um, source maps for our styles is we're going to convert these strings into objects. This way we can pass in a specific option. So let me go options. That takes an object as well. Source map true. I'm just going to duplicate this. Just makes it a little easier. Cool. So let's run our dev server. Make sure everything works. Yep. So Everything's working, hot module reloading is working, that's good. We didn't break anything. Save that, come back here. Now let's go to our production config. And let's see what we're going to need in here. Uh, let's see, we can get rid of the hot module reloading here. We don't need that for production. And... I believe that's all for this one. So we're going to keep the mini CSS extract plugin for production because you wanted to spit out that CSS file. Oh, also important, we're going to change the mode here to production. So Webpack knows that this is a production build. And then another thing I want to do is inside of our post CSS, you remember earlier when we were first setting this up, I um, included a plugin called CSS Nano that minifies and compresses our CSS. Um, but then I removed it just for demonstration purposes so we could see the actual CSS output and it wouldn't be minified. Um, so what I want to do is I want to only use CSS Nano in the production builds but not in the development builds. And so that's why I set up my node environment equals production because I'm going to set up a conditional like this. So if we do simple if statement so process.env.node env is equal to production. Copy this. Uh, let's cut it actually. And let's put in our CSS nano. CSS nano. Copy this again. Else. So else being we're not in production, so development, don't use it. So if we're in production, use CSS Nano, and then this way you can specify whatever post-CSS plugins you only want specifically for production builds. And then otherwise, um, when we're in development, only use these. So you could technically, because you're most likely using a modern browser, uh, you could probably get rid of auto prefixer in development mode if you really wanted to, but since we're not writing to the file, it's just keeping it in memory. It doesn't really cost us. I'm just going to leave that as is. Uh, so that wraps it up for this video. So again, what we did is we set up two different configs, one specifically for uh, development and one for production. And then in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a third config because if you notice, there's quite a lot of duplication and repetition between these two files. So in our third uh, config. We're going to have all the options that Webpack needs that both development and the production configs use. So this way it keeps all your configs dry. The DRY don't repeat yourself principle and then that way there's only one place um, in order for you to update and make changes so you don't have to duplicate it and repeat yourself in multiple files. So in this video, like I mentioned in the last video, we're going to be setting up our third config which is a, a common config which will contain all of the um, configuration that both is shared between the development config and our production config. 
So in the documentation under guides, under this production tab, you will see that they give us this option to use something that's called Webpack Merge. So first we need to install this module. Let's do that. And then if we come back here, you'll see there's a webpack.common.dev.prod. So we need to create that new common.js file. So I'm just going to duplicate the dev one webpack.common.js and then if we come back to the documentation you'll kind of see how this works they give an example here of the webpack common which is pretty straightforward but then if you look at the dev and prod configs you'll see that they're including this module called merge which we just installed webpack merge and then when you're exporting you use this merge function and so what they're doing is they're also including the common config and so this it's kind of like you can think of it somewhat like inheritance in a way, in a sense as in so the dev config is inheriting if you will in air quotes um, the functionality and the configuration from common and prod is doing the same thing so let's see what that actually looks like in practice uh, so the first thing we're gonna do is remember the common config is just everything that both the dev config and the production config share exactly so that way we don't have our code duplicated in multiple places uh, so the first thing we're gonna do we're gonna get rid of the mode uh, we're gonna leave entry we're gonna get rid of this dev tool and we're going to get rid of our CSS the plugin can stay as is since this is going to be shared I'm just going to get rid of the title we don't really need that because we're going to use this um, for both the production and the dev config and that's pretty much it so as you can tell um, both the dev and the prod are going to share the same entry they're both sharing the same behavior for our JavaScript files that we want to pass through Babel Loader. Uh, we're using the Webpack plugin for both of them. And then our output is going to be the same for both. So then if we come back to Webpack Dev, what we want to do is delete all the common stuff and only keep the stuff that's necessary for uh, development. So we can completely delete all this. But remember, we're going to need to include <clears throat> merge which comes from that webpack merge module we installed earlier and then we're going to need to install oops or pull in our common config so require webpack dot common cool so then our module dot export we're going to use that merge function common and then pass that in and then we just need to close our parentheses down here so again just to reiterate we're using webpack merge we're pulling in our common webpack common.js file here and then we're just merging the two together um, so if you remember we already have the entry set up in our common we can delete that keep the mode keep all the dev tool dev server um, we don't need the JavaScript stuff anymore because that's in the common config now. We don't need any of these plugins and we don't need the output because that's all in common. So now our webpack.dev config is super concise and it only deals with specifically what's specific to the dev. So let's do the same thing for production. I'm just going to copy this up here. Uh, we don't need path and we don't need that, but we do need the mini CSS extract plugin. So let's see. Uh, dev server entry, let's see. Dev server and entry we don't need. JavaScript we don't need. Uh, we don't need this. We do need that, and we don't need the output. So that cleans up things pretty nicely. Let's give this a test and make sure we didn't break anything. 
in our dev. Great. And let's do the same thing for our production. Great, so we successfully set everything up. Now we've got three separate configs. Everything's nice and clean and short, and each file has is only dealing with its own specific responsibilities. So in the next video, we're gonna go over code splitting, and I'm gonna show you how to, um, in our example, I'm gonna show you how if we're using a third-party library such as like Lodash, and you have multiple JavaScript files that are pulling in Lodash, this way each file doesn't have to pull in the entire library, it'll extract it to its own file and it'll keep your bundles nice and small. Alright guys, so in this video we're going to be discussing how to do code splitting with Webpack. Um, before we jump into that, I forgot that I made a mistake in the last video when we were doing the common config. I forgot to update our uh, production config to take use of merge. So if we do merge common and then just add that parenthesis down here. Sorry about that. Let's build it. Make sure this is working. Cool. Everything's good. All right, so let's get back on to code splitting. So there's a few different ways you can do code splitting in Webpack, and I'm going to be showing you the most kind of common way. Uh, the simplest way is this entry points method. Um, but this is, oh, I'm not going to be covering this. This is really straightforward. You just include two different files in your entry and then Webpack will just output both of them separately. It's not really code splitting, I don't think, because you're specifically specifying, okay, import this one and then spit it out over here. Uh, I'm going to be showing you a kind of more useful method. And the point of this one is to prevent duplication. So in the example that they show here and the one that we're going to be doing in this video, is let's say you have two separate JavaScript files and both of them depend upon and are importing Lodash. If you did not do code splitting, both this index and this another module file would have the entire Lodash library inside of them. So then by doing code splitting, the index and the other module file will just have their necessary code in them and then the Lodash library will be spit out into its own chunk or its own bundle and that way it keeps things really clean and it keeps the files really small and it prevents you from having to load a library multiple times and it keeps your bundles and you know your network requests and like the page speed and everything much much faster. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is we need to create another file and then we need to set up our webpack config to import that new file. So let's go back to our code editor and for the sake of clarity and to make things easier, underneath the source uh, directory, I'm going to create a new one just called JS, and I'm going to put our index inside of there. Then I'm going to create a new one called sum.js. And we can close these. So let's do index and then sum. Okay, so now back in our webpack comment, we need to update our entry here to include both of those files. So if we go here, we go index, the key is going to be our file name, so index, import, source, js, index, and then we do depend on shared. Let me duplicate that again. This one's going to be called sum, our sum file, and then depends upon shared, which is a new key lodash. So again, it's following this example here. So we have our index file, we have another one which in our case is called sum. Both of these depend on this shared file which is the lodash library. Then the most important thing we need to do is tell um, Webpack to split up the chunks. So by adding in this code, it's going to split the chunks and then every chunk is going to be split into its own file. So if we go down here, just above plugins, we'll do optimization, split chunks, chunks, all. 
cool. Um, so then let's install Lodash. And then we'll go back to our code editor while that's installing. And we will just update this import underscore from Lodash. And then I'm just going to use a simple Lodash function. I'm going to use the join method. I'm just going to type this out and then I will explain what it does in just one second. Module load. Oop. Loaded. Okay, so this is just uh, join is a method or a function that it comes from Lodash. And essentially what it's going to do, it's going to take this array of these three strings, index, module, and loaded, and join them together and separate them by a space. You could put in a dash or whatever you want, but I'll just do a space. So I'm going to copy this and put it into my sum file, but I don't need to include the CSS in that file, only the index. Um, so let's go back, let's run the dev server. Uh, yeah, so we're getting an error, and I'm glad we got this because this is uh, a common thing and this is important for you to know. If you read this error, conflict, multiple chunks emit assets to the same file name bundle.js. So what exactly does that mean? Well, if you noticed before um, this video, we, were only, we only had a single file, so we could hard code this and give it a file name of bundle.js. However, this is no longer viable because now we have an index, a sum, and what if we have 10 different files? They're all going to be called bundle.js and it confuses Webpack so it blows up and throws an error. Um, but if you remember back in our production config, we can use this syntax here, which is basically a placeholder. So if we go back here and we just do name.bundle.js, now it's going to output a file for index.bundle.js, sum.bundle.js, and whatever other files. Shared will be one. So you'll see how that works in just a second. Let's run the dev server again. Can't find main.scss. That's right, that's because we moved this inside of a directory, so we need to go one further back. Okay, index module loaded index module loaded and let's change this to say sum so it's a little clear where this is all coming from cool so now both of those are working so I just wanted to do that for testing because obviously in development it's not going to do code splitting so if we do the build command now now it should be outputting more files cool and if you see it's got this 486.bundle index.bundle uh, share.bundle, sum.bundle, so let's take a look inside of our dist folder here. Uh, here's our and here's all our various different chunks. Here's our sum file, here's our shared bundle, and this 486 is kinda weird. This is actually Lodash. I don't know why it's called 486, but if you look, the 486 license is for Lodash. So by doing this, now we've got all of our files imported and exported into uh, separate files. So this way our main bundle and our index.bundle.js, our sum.bundle, you can see how small they are. These are no longer including Lodash actually within them. They're just going to reference the main Lodash bundle. So that's pretty much how you do code splitting um, in Webpack. And so for the next video, we're just going to do a recap because that pretty much wraps things up for this course. And um, I've also got some bonus videos that I think you're going to find are really helpful that aren't specific to Webpack, but they're very helpful for um, a lot of modern tools like ESLint and Prettier and uh, Jest for unit testing. So just some tools that I think will help you as you're building out your Webpack starter kits. Um, that don't necessarily have to do with Webpack specifically, but they're tools that you're going to want to use for linting and formatting and stuff like that. 
So in this video, I, I just wanted to quickly um, do a recap and go over everything that we've learned so far in this course. Um, so if you remember, we started off going over the general concepts about entry and output. Um, now you're familiar with what loaders are, you're familiar with plugins, and you're familiar with different modes for development and production. Uh, we also did a whole bunch of different things. So if you remember, we set up, uh, obviously installed and set up Webpack from scratch. Um, we set up our dev server here. We set up source maps. We set up hot module reloading. Um, we set up and configured Babel so that we can write future JavaScript today. We set up CSS and SCSS loaders and the source maps for those. We set up post CSS and how to set up and configure the various plugins for post CSS and also how to distinguish between different environments for production and uh, development environments for loading different plugins for post-CSS. Um, we went over a whole bunch of different plugins. So now you're familiar with how Webpack plugins worked. We have this HTML plugin here, and then we've got this mini CSS extract plugin here for minifying and compressing our CSS for, for production builds. And you also learned how to extrapolate um, various Webpack configs into separate files. So we ended up in the end with three total files. Again, the common is uh, configuration and options that and plugins that will be shared between both dev and production. Then we have a dev-specific file and a production-specific file. And then at the very end, you learn all about code splitting so that um, now when you have uh, different JavaScript files that all depend and share the same kind of third-party library or it even could be some of your own utils or your own functions that you write as your project grows. Now those um, separate files will no longer include the entire library or function. Everything will be split out into its own separate chunk that keeps you know your bundles super small, it keeps the network requests small, and it keeps your page load speeds really quick and you know it's that's always good for the end users so I hope you guys got a, a lot out of this course um, I tried to keep it you know pretty short but I tried to pack in as much content as I possibly could um, I know this course is free but my goal was to basically give you like 80 percent understanding of what webpack is so now you should be completely comfortable with reading and creating your own webpack files either from scratch or when you jump into a project that already exists, now you can be able to figure out what's going on, modify it, add plugins, loaders, and things like that as needed. Um, but I've also included some additional bonus videos that really have nothing to do with Webpack specifically. So, um, but make sure to check those out because I think they're super useful. So I'm going to show you how to um, set up and configure Jest for unit tests, how to set up uh, ESLint for linting, prettier for your JavaScript formatting. And then I'm going to show you this cool tool called um, Husky and Lint Stage. And that's going to, before each time you do like a git commit, it's going to run ESLint and prettier over your files to make sure that all the formatting and all the, um, the linting is correct. So that way if there's any errors with any linting, you won't be able to commit. It's a really, really cool tool. So again, I hope, hope you guys got a lot out of this course. If there's any questions or you get stuck, feel free to reach out to me in the forums or ask me questions, send me messages, and I'll be sure to get back to you as soon as I can. All right, so in this video and one of these bonus videos, we're going to be setting up Jest for setting up our uh, unit tests. Um, if you're not familiar with Jest, it's a very popular unit testing framework created by Facebook. Uh, it's one of my favorites at the moment because it has everything you pretty much need all built in and it makes it super easy to get up and running with a whole bunch of functionality like mocks and uh, DOM manipulation and a whole bunch of really really cool stuff so if you're not if you don't are not partial to any particular unit test testing tool or framework and you're kinda wanna get into it I highly recommend Jest that's why I'm creating this video uh, so the first thing we need to do is we need to install it so I'm just gonna click this copy button here While that is installing, we also need to, if you scroll down a little bit, since we're using Babel, we need to install an additional dependency. Now we already have Babel Core and Babel Preset ENV, so we really only need this Babel Jest. So, okay, that's done. npm install save dev. 
Babel jest. And then we need to update our Babel config. So I'm just going to copy this. And they're using a babel.config.js and we're using a different file. Um, so just for the sake of easiness, I'm just going to babel.config.js and then I'm just going to paste that in here. Basically it's doing the exact same thing. We're telling it to use babel preset env and then we're just setting up the node target. Okay, cool. So everything should be set up now. So let's create a file and let's write some tests to confirm that everything's working. Um, so what I like to do, and this is kind of a just um, convention, is within my source I create a new directory and it's under underscore tests underscore underscore. And that's where our tests are going to go. So within that I'm going to create a new file called sum.test.js. And if you notice, I'm just basically following along with their little tutorial here. So they've got this sum.js file, so let's create that. So let's just create a simple function, sum a b return a plus b. export default sum so simple little function takes two parameters adds them together and then the test we're going to import sum our function from js sum test adds one and adds two numbers together. Turn this into a function and then we expect the sum, right? So we're calling our function now sum passing in one and two and we expect one plus two to be three. Pretty simple. Now another thing we need to do is to update our package JSON. So after build, we're going to create a test script, and that's just going to run jest. So if I do nr test, run our tests. Import sum. So we have an issue. Cannot find module dot dot js sum. Okay, let's figure that out. Oh, it's because it's in the same. Let's do that up. Whoops. Just the path is a little off. Let's try that. Cool. So now we're running. Adds two numbers together. Got a green light. Everything passed. So pretty simple. That's how you set up Jest. So now in your starter kit with Webpack, now you've got built-in unit tests. All right, so in this video, we're going to be going over how to set up and configure ESLint and Prettier. Um, I got a lot of my information from this blog post, which you can find at this URL up here. Um, so if you want further information and to go a little deeper of what I'm about to show you, definitely check this out. Uh, if you're not familiar what ESLint is, it's a linter, so it's going to go over and you set up a whole bunch of different rules like um, how you want your code to be written and it'll automatically go over and fix things and it'll throw errors and stuff if you're not conforming to them. And it's super powerful and it's highly customizable, um, but for the sake of making things pretty easy and also just a convention that a whole bunch of people in the JavaScript community tend to use is we're going to be installing and using the Airbnb ESLint rules which you can find here um, on their GitHub and you can see it has almost a hundred thousand stars which is kind of insane um, and so this way we don't have to configure 
and add all of our rules ourselves. We're just going to use this Airbnb file as a base. And then if we want to tweak things, we can do that as needed. And then finally, we're going to be installing and configuring uh, Prettier. And so Prettier and ESLint work really well together. Prettier um, is a formatter. So it's very opinionated. And what's nice about that is that when you're working with a group of people, and everyone's got Prettier installed and you have that in your project, all of your JavaScript files are gonna be formatted and look the same. So you're not gonna have like some people using double quotes, some using single quotes, some spacing things this way and others not the other way. Prettier is just gonna handle all of that for us. So let's go back to our terminal and let's start installing all these packages. So we're gonna npm install save-dev Prettier and eslint. We need those first. Cool. NPM. Why is this jumping around? Okay. NPM install dash dash save dash dev ES lint config prettier and ESLint plugin prettier. Those, these packages are um, plugins basically for ESLint to make ESLint aware of prettier so the two of them can kind of work in harmony together. And then we're going to run this npx install peer dependencies dash dash dev ESLint config Airbnb. That's going to set up our Airbnb config. Okay, while that's installing, we need to set up and create some new files within our project. So <clears throat> in the root of our project, we're going to create a new file called .eslintrc.js. So this is eslint's config file. Uh, we don't want it in source. We want it in the root directory. So just make sure you're not inside source. You're in the root with all these other configs. And then we're going to also create a dot prettier rc that's prettier's config file so for prettier i'm just gonna paste this in from the repo which i showed you is available in github so this is where we would set up our prettier configuration so this is saying uh, always use semicolons always add trailing commas always use single quotes and the print width is 80 characters wide for eslint i'm going to do the same thing i'm going to copy and paste from the repo so in our ESLint config, we're extending our Airbnb rules and Prettier, and we're using the Prettier plugin, and then setting up one little rule for Prettier here when there's errors. So now if we, let me shut this down, open that back up again. So now with everything set up, if we go to our index file and we do yeah we can kind of mess around with some formatting here uh, validation was installed locally if you trust this version yeah we want to allow that So we can set up our editor to format on save. So now if I Okay, so sorry about that. I had made a mistake earlier, which is why this wasn't working. Um, this plugins property in our ESLint config needs to be an array. And I was just passing in a string. That's why things weren't working. Uh, by the way, too, um, I'm using VS Code, obviously. Um, you need to install the ESLint config, or the, I'm sorry, the ESLint extension here. And then also if you search for Prettier, those are the extensions to work with VS Code. So that way when we go into our index file here, 
and we've got this foo and so let's say we use double quotes and then we go to save you'll notice now we're forcing it because we're telling prettier uh, single quotes and add a semicolon which it did so if I revert that see I've got double quotes no semicolon now I save and it's single quotes and semicolon so now this way ES lens working Prettier is all set up and configured, and I've set everything up in my editor to format on save, so that way I don't even have to think about this stuff. I just go ahead, type my code. Every time I save, Prettier and ESLint are going to go over and um, check for errors and format things as necessary. And so see, your, see how I'm getting this error right here? Foo is assigned a value, but it's never used, and it's coming from ESLint. No one used VARs. So these two tools are super powerful and they're very very helpful and I strongly encourage you to use them even if you're just a solo dev but they're even more useful when you work on a team okay so in this video we're gonna be installing some tools called Husky and Linstage and basically what this is gonna do is in your project if you have it um, enabled as a git repo and git's been initialized essentially what this is gonna do is we're gonna tell it to run prettier and our ESLint um, on all of our files that are staged for commit before you actually commit them. So this way this ensures that before you can actually check in and commit your code it conforms to the prettier standards, the formatting, and the ESLint. Um, it's super handy and it makes, again, it's useful even if you're a single dev because it makes your code look consistent the same but it's even more useful when you're working on a team or with more than one developer because this way it ensures that all the linting rules and the formatting everything you've set up is actually conformed to and utilized. So I'm just on the prettier documentation here and there's this pre-commit hook section and so I'm just going to copy this command here paste that into my terminal. While that's installing um, I'm going to put all these links um, in the course but there's also this handy um, dev.2 blog post that someone wrote that I thought was helpful and then here's documentation to uh, what LinStage is on their actual GitHub repo. So you can find out more about it and find out how to tweak it to run um, different tools and things like that. Okay, so that's updated and running. So what that did is install the tools that we need. And it also wrote this um, configuration inside of our package JSON. So this is a uh, Husky is installed and the hook is a git pre-commit hook and then it's going to fire off lint stage and then these are the lint stage properties that we want here and so what we have here is we're going to I'm going to paste this in from um, the repo because what it gives you is a little bit different I had to customize it in order to work with this particular project so I just pasted that in again from the github repo um, for this course and essentially what this is saying is lint stage um, before um, a git commit look at every single file in the source JS directory that ends in a .js extension run prettier over it and format it if necessary and then run eslint over it same fo uh, folder and files and then this fix dry run is this rather than uh, writing to it it's just going to output any errors that we might have so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some changes and if you notice I've already got some errors from ESLint it's saying that this module this underscore is defined but it's never used and this variable is defined but never used so if I go back here and since I'm already in a uh, I have git enabled if I go to commit this now when I run it it's going to run and the prettier passed, but ESLint failed, and now it's throwing out the errors. The underscore for Lodash is defined but never used, and the foo variable is assigned a value but is never used. So this is super handy because now you need to go back and fix these things before you can actually check in and commit your code. So let's just delete this and delete this. And now if we make our changes, fixed ESLint errors and we commit it and everything passed and now we're good to go so I hopefully you guys will find this tool useful if you've never heard of it or if you never use it I definitely encourage you to check it out and give it a shot